video lecture. First, we're going to talk philosophy. We're going to talk these, these notions of modernism, as we've discussed it in this class, and also talk a little bit about what we as viewers expect from art. And we're going to return to that progress of visual art that I've used previously in the class to talk about realism and expressionism. And then we're going to take another step in that progression. And then once we're all settled in that business, we're going to take an unexpected detour and talk about World War II for a minute. And as I note there, I promise you the World War II stuff is relevant. And this is where I am bringing in sort of unexpected elements to come together a bit here. And then after we've got philosophy, modernism, World War II, we're going to sort of sum all that up by talking about existentialism and this notion that everything matters and also nothing matters. And that is not even a remotely an attempt to summarize existentialism, but just to touch on some of the ideas that I'll get into later. So let's embark. Here we have some of our various uh, playwrights and modernist thinkers here that we've read and, and sort of dealt with this semester. And I want to sum up quickly what we've talked about so far if we, as we talk about modernism, right? It's this fundamental belief that by studying the world, Right? We can make sense of the world and therefore solve problems, whether it's Karl Marx or Freud or whether it's our playwrights on the left. Right, There's Sophie Treadwell and we've got um, uh, Chekhov and his fantastic Dalmatian. I'm sorry, Dachshund. Um, but this is how this is this is the business we've been embracing so far. Right. And I think, first of all, before answering that question, we all believe this. Right. You wouldn't go to college if you didn't believe this central premise that's in the middle of my cheesy little four-pointed speech balloon, right? But moving to that question below, what is limited or incomplete or just outright wrong about this viewpoint? My question for you, and if you don't have any answers right now, come back to this question as we move forward, right? This is both true and not true. It is both a true statement and wildly limited and wildly incomplete in the way it attempts to assess the human condition. So that's sort of my starting point for how we're thinking about this, right? And to put that into practice, um, I've got our, our man Arthur Miller here sitting at a typewriter, and I want to talk about this modernist approach to art, which very much sums up a lot of what we've been talking about, right? So here's Miller. Miller's got an idea in his head. The American dream is broken. And he takes that idea and he puts it into his play, into Death of a Salesman, right? So the play says... The American dream is broken. Then we take that idea, which went from the playwright's head to the paper, to the script, right? And we put it on stage. And then the people on stage say, they don't literally say it, but this is the story of Death of a Salesman. The American dream is broken, right? And then we put that play up in front of an audience and they see the message and they go, oh, right. Oh, yes. The American dream is broken. Yes, I understand. So to sum that up differently, the artist creates meaning. The artist puts meaning into their art. The audience views the art and receives and understands the artist's meaning. Right? Right? Again, just like with my previous statement, I hope we believe in steps one, two, and three. Otherwise, what are you all doing making theater as a career? Right? But we also recognize, and here is another question, that step one, two, and three is it is linear, it is rational, it is also problematic, inaccurate, limited, etc. So here's your discussion prompt number two. You don't need to worry about the discussion prompt that ends with question marks and exclamation points, right? But that other discussion, discussion prompt, in what way is step one, two, and three an oversimplification of how and why art communicates meaning to an audience? All right, so like I said, we're going to take a next step in visual art here. We talked about Millet's The Gleaners as a good uh, uh, sort of example of the philosophies, both in visual art and in storytelling of all kinds of realism, right? The artist and the uh, um, audience sit together and look at women in a field, right? We say, all right, this is an objective reproduction of actual real life. Then we move to, and I'm skipping um, our Monet example because I'm just in the interest of time. Then we move to expressionism where this is not Monk and myself standing at the end of a wharf going, wow, look at that weird guy scream, right? This is Monk saying, look inside my head and see how it feels to be me. So we shifted from realism to expressionism. And my next question for you is, what do we make of this? Yes, that's right. The background doodle for this uh, um, 
background image for this slideshow is Jackson Pollock's number 1A. Hangs, it hangs in the uh, Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York City. It is about six feet high and about eight feet long. And it is exemplary of the style of Jackson Pollock. These are among the most coveted and valuable, financially valuable paintings in the modern art world. So this, I don't have a discussion prompt with a question mark on the end of it, but tell me about this. Oh, wait, I do. I put one in. Look at me. What is this painting doing that is similar to or different from the previous two? Is this even art? Why or why not? There are all kinds of pros and cons that might answer that question. I want you to dive into the complexity of the question and be ready to talk about it. All right. Now, detour number one. Let's talk about World War II, right? We're going to talk about World War II in two capacities. We're going to talk about it on one hand, and we're going to talk about it on the other hand. So let's start with the one hand, and I'll get where we're going here. Let's review World War I. As you recall, that was a war that was politically meaningless, right? A domino effect of alliances. There, it was not a good versus evil kind of thing. It was just this ridiculous um, sort of unreasoned dive into complete chaos. It was trench warfare. There was no uh, maneuver. There was no, it was essentially this anti-modernist war, right? Because you can't outthink the other person. You can't be noble or an individualistic crusader in World War I. You're just going to jump out of a trench and catch a bullet. Or if you don't jump out of the trench, you might just die from poison gas, right? This completely meaningless war. And a war that killed, just to review, 10 million soldiers and 10 million civilians. Almost an order of magnitude larger than the, the wars that came before it. All right, now let's talk about World War II. My on the one hand about World War II is, in many ways, this war recovered a lot of the, and I use this word carefully, a lot of the logic and rational impetus behind war that World War I didn't have. So here's what I'm talking about, right? This is a clear battle of good and evil. Nazi Germany, imperialist Japan, fascist Italy, like unequivocal go down in history forever as evil, period, right? Allied against them, we have, right, democratic France, England, the United States. We have good guys versus bad guys here in a very clear way that didn't exist in World War I, right? We also have the clear necessity of patriotism and heroism. If the world is at threat from evil, you stand up and do what's right and die for your country, in a, in a way that will help defeat evil, which is exactly what happened, right? We also have, because of the progress of warfare, we actually have a relatively modernist war, which is, I can outthink you. I can build a better tank than you can. I can build more tanks than you can. I can outmaneuver you on the battlefield. I can outproduce you in the factories, right? And essentially, science even to the end with the atom bomb, right? Science wins this war. Lots of other things do too, right? But as opposed to all of us just falling in trenches and hanging out until we all, you know, hundreds of us, hundreds of thousands of us died, we actually have a thing where you can like solve problems and outmaneuver and outproduce and outwit. It's a very modernist war in that regard. We have, as I mentioned earlier, alliances for democracy that are allied against fascism or to put it differently, evil. Right? So we've got a modernist war. It's logical, it's rational, it's justified, it makes sense. There's a reason why America in post-World War II, and I'm talking about for decades and decades, in that post-war era, went back again and again and again to World War II, because it made sense. It was clear, right? That's why until we get into a place where we're comfortable making movies about the Vietnam War, the majority of war movies are made about World War II because we were the good guys and they were the bad guys and we won and it's a really good story. And folks, again, those things are mostly true. Well, they are unequivocally true, right? On this one hand. On the other hand, let's take a look at this. Remember, 10 million soldiers, 10 million civilians in World War I. We nearly doubled that number of civilians dead, or soldiers dead rather. So we're killing a lot more soldiers in World War II than we did in World War I. United States loses 400,000. Soviet Union loses an unthinkable 8.6 million soldiers dead in this war, right? So we've killed 18 million soldiers, and check out this number. We kill 40 million civilians. 
Also, you notice the little tildes at the beginning of those two numbers? These numbers, 18 and 40, are disputed and unclear to, the, to a number that's like plus or minus a couple of million. So if you look at World War II, we don't know how many people died to the size of the metropolitan Chicago area. That's lunacy. The number of people that died is so vast and so inconceivable. Like, I don't know what 40 million people is. We can't put that in any rational place or make any real sense of it. We can just go, wow, that's a lot. The Soviet Union loses 16.9 million uh, soldiers. Inconceivable, or sorry, civilians. Inconceivable. The Holocaust takes the lives of, of about 6 million Jews as well as hundreds and thousands of other, right? Uh, we know the Holocaust persecuted gay people. It persecuted those who were seen as, eth as ethnically unclean. It was primarily targeted at the uh, Jewish population, but there were lots of other people too, right? Now, we talk about that modernist warfare business where, where war is logical and makes sense. Well, let's take 43,000 dead in the German bombing of London. That is an irrational move on the part of the Germans that is designed purely to break the spirit of the British, right? We are, they are targeting school buildings. They are targeting purely civilian areas so that they could win this war. There's no sense in that, right? Imagine tomorrow a bomb dropped on your neighbor's house, but not yours. It's irrational and it's filled with horror. And of course, and you probably had to guess I was coming to this, we do that too, right? One of the things we don't talk a lot about in um, World War II history is the night that the United States bombed a uh, firebomb Tokyo. We killed 100,000 Japanese, mainly civilians, in one night. We dropped incendiary weapons, that is, flame-creating weapons, on Tokyo, a city of wood and paper, uh, and created a firestorm that you see uh, the evidence of in the, in the bottom right there. They killed 100,000 people in one night. Again, no different from the German bomb of London. We were just the good guys, right? Right? And then, of course, we kill at least 140,000 dead, and that's just at Hiroshima, right? And we also give birth to this whole business of atomic warfare. That alliance I talked about, you'll notice I deliberately left out Russia and, you know, China. So the Soviet Union and China, not exactly allies after the fact, more like allies of convenience. There are very reasonable historical arguments along the lines of Stalin was actually not that much better than Hitler, but he just happened to be fighting on our side against Hitler, and so it worked out. I've got the Berlin Wall there to just sort of visually illustrate how quickly that alliance moved right into the next phase, which was the Cold War. This then is a fundamentally anti-modernist war. It makes no sense. The size, the scope, the purpose, None of this war makes any sense. The numbers and the devastation are inconceivable. And done because, essentially, Germany and Japan wanted to expand their territory? It's, right? So it's important to remember. It's a very modernist war, very much good versus evil, but also it is completely irrational. It is both of these things at the same time. And here's what I'm getting at, right, is that we... And again, by we, I mean people like artists and academics and philosophers and thinkers. Mostly after World War II, people are not wandering around the world going, gosh, this is a world of contradictions, right? If you're in America, you're celebrating that you saved the day and you're looking for a good job in a house in suburbia or whatever, right? If you're in Europe, you're just trying not to starve to death because the whole country or the whole continent's ruined. But thinkers, artists, philosophers are going down this road of a destabilized understanding of modernism that is that is foundationally filled with contradictions. War, let's talk about the contradictions of war. This modernist view of war, war is clear, it begins, it ends, things change. That's true. But also, a postmodern view of war, and don't worry too much about that term yet, a postmodern view of war is fundamentally contradictory. We go right from World War II into the Cold War. You'd like a contradictory term? How about Cold War? It's a war that we're actively not fighting, right? What is the purpose of the Cold War? Well, it's to make sure that Soviet communism doesn't spread over the entire globe, I guess. But we're not fighting the Soviets. So it's complicated, right? And let's talk about this business of the threat of nuclear holocaust. You want a good contradiction? Here's one. The reason that you build a nuclear bomb is so that you never have to use it. 
because everybody knows if we actually go into a nuclear war, everyone dies. So you tell me what other thing in the whole world that it exists that we try to make so that we never have to use it. There are some things, right? But that threat of nuclear holocaust, which renders you the individual as completely meaningless and which renders scientific progress, we work so hard to create atomic warfare so that we will never have an atomic war. It doesn't make any sense, right? Now, I will say the existence of atomic warfare and the threat, right? Mutually assured destruction is a term you've heard before. The threat of mutually assured destruction actually works. The wars stay small. We don't fight the Soviet Union in an enormous land battle in Eastern Europe. We fight their proxies in Korea and Vietnam, and those wars aren't good either, right? But the fact that we can kill every human on Earth means that we kill fewer humans? <sighs> All right, okay. War doesn't make any sense. Got it. Let's try technology and science. We know the modern view of science, right? Knowledge is good. And as I said at the beginning of the slideshow, the more we study, the more we understand ourselves in the world, and the modernist viewpoint means that, that, that we're better off because the more we can see how we fit in the universe, right? Okay, well, a postmodern viewpoint would say, let's look at some conclusions that could be drawn from things that we've studied. Uh, okay, and I've just chosen these, right? These aren't like particular post-war discoveries. Some of these things I'm gonna talk about were known, some were sort of known, but the philosophical implications of the kind of stuff I'm gonna talk about, pretty important. Space, right? The more we get the ability to look out into space, the better we understand what space is comprised of, the better we, and I mean, it's absolutely necessary scientific exploration, um, both, you know, whether it's like going to the moon or going to Mars, or whether it's building better telescopes to see the structure of the universe. So speaking of that structure, here is a view of the near known universe. This is a view of basically like this is as far as, as we can see, given our, our, uh, the power of our telescopes. And the reason there's this black space on either side of us is because we are seeing from a point middle-ish in the um, Milky Way galaxy, right? So if you think about a disc-shaped galaxy, if you try to look directly out the side of it, you have to look through all the stars and they're essentially blocking your view. So we can't see out the sides of our galaxy. We can see out of it at an angle, right? Oh, by the way, those dots, those aren't stars. Those are galaxies. So if you were thinking of this as like a visual portrayal of, I don't know, the night sky from Earth or something, yeah, no. Those are galaxies. Just as a reminder, right, the near-known universe shows us that there are approximately 2 trillion known galaxies out there. And just as a reminder from your astronomy class that you may or may not have taken, as an example, the Milky Way galaxy has about 400 billion stars in it. Yeah, I did the math for you. That's how many known stars there are. That number is both really important to know about and understand, and also completely 100% meaningless because it's so big it can't possibly mean anything, right? So we look at space. We say space is inconceivably large, and it tells us that we are inconceivably small. Humanity might not matter in this larger landscape. I mean, mathematically, it doesn't matter at all. All right, all right, okay, how about time? Let's take a look at time. What you're about to see is a rendering of the known history of the Earth put into a 24-hour clock, right? So if you took 24 hours of a day and, and rendered it to look like uh, the history of the, the Earth, Here's what that looks like, right? I'm sorry, 12 hour day, apologies, right? Oh, no, wait, no, 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 it's midnight to 11.58. It is a 24 hour day, right? So the earth is formed at the beginning of the day, right? It effectively zero, zero, zero. Just look all the way around here. Humans, not civilized recorded history, but just humans show up at 11.58.43. We have been on Earth for 17 seconds of a 24-hour day, or 0.00001% of Earth's history. That's it. So we've got space, time. 
is inconceivably vast and we are inconceivably brief. And again, I'm just talking about humanity. I'm not even talking about recorded history. And I'm certainly not even talking about something the size of an individual person's life, which wouldn't even show up on that measurement that I, that I just gave, right? I know, I know this is a super cheerful and very uplifting uh, lecture, but trust me, there is some redemption here at the end of it, right? But these are things that are true that are, we've got to figure out a way to, you know, as, as thinkers and artists and philosophers, we have to reconcile ourselves with these realities. All right, all right. So I can't understand space. I can't understand time. What Can I at least understand like what's inside of me, how I work and who I am? Oh, all right. Here's a view inside your brain. This is a pretty artist rendering. It doesn't literally look like this, but it's close, right? And what you're looking at is the neural, the, the electronic and electrochemical network that, that makes up your brain right? In your brain, there are a billion neurons. Each neuron has a hundred thousand connections with other neurons. And from that electrochemical network that is described in numbers down there comes consciousness. And we still don't really understand a lot about that very simple sentence I just said. Lord knows you as an individual don't, you're not like, oh gosh, I, my neurons are, right? We don't process any of this stuff, but it's certainly happening in this gut level, inconceivable kind of a way. All right. So <laughs> you have no idea how you work, right? Oh, but at least we know our own experiences, right? Like I may not need to understand the electrochemical complexity of my brain, but I at least know what happened to me yesterday or when I was a kid, right? Right? Here's what neuroscience tells us about memory. Every time you remember something, you edit the memory. Not deliberately, but you do. And you edit the memory based on the mood you're in, based on the experiences you've had since then. So like that really precious memory you have of Thanksgiving in the woods at the cabin at your uncle's house, I'm making all this up, right? That, and the smell and the way that these people talked and laughed and the, the, the light, that's not how it happened. It's kind of like how it happened, right? But if that happened 10 years ago, every time you remembered it, you changed it. So what do we do with all this, right? Like I was told, I was promised an explanation. I was told that modernism would fix this, but here are my questions, right? Does all this modernism actually explain anything? So here's my postmodern idea. The more we study, the more we know how much we don't know, and the more we realize how meaningless we are. Are we better? These are the kinds of questions, and I trust me, this does relate to your reading of Waiting for Godot or watching of Waiting for Godot for Monday, right? These are the kinds of questions that people like Samuel Beckett and Jackson Pollock are considering and thinking about, right? So we get to this place where war is both good and sensible and also evil and insane. Science is necessary and empowering, but also completely terrifying and renders the human being into this tiny little meaningless blip in the universe. The human experience is absolutely real. You did go to your uncle's house in the cabin, like that happened for Thanksgiving, but it's also utterly transient. It's here, it's gone, it's unreliable. Memory's not a film that you can just go back and rewatch. It's something more elusive than that. So what's 100% clear? Not a thing. What 100% carries meaning? Not a thing. What can you actually 100% understand? Not a thing. Being human, therefore, in this post-war world of contradictions is fundamentally confusing. So if life lacks reliable and purpose and meaning, if life lacks reliable purpose and meaning, why should art claim to have reliable purpose and meaning? I, I actually need you to answer that question, right? Because Folks who say, there are folks who start saying, it really shouldn't. Those folks, they got a point. The people who say it should have meaning also have a point, right? But embrace that moment for a little bit. 